is the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. Here is your host, Brian McClanahan. Welcome back to the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. This is your host, Brian McClanahan, and this is episode 190, covering the week of October 7th through October 11th, 2019. Glad to have you back on the program. Very glad to be here. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Abbeville Institute. Like our Facebook page at Abbeville Institute. And of course, subscribe to our YouTube page at Abbeville Institute. If you don't want to search for all those social media accounts, just go to our webpage, abbevilleinstitute.org. At the top of the page, you'll find all of our social media buttons. While you're there, give us an email address and we'll give you a free ebook. And you get our daily dose of Dixie Monday through Friday and our weekly email on Saturday or Sunday, which includes a link to this podcast. Don't forget to download our free mobile application. Just go to your app store, wherever you get your apps. Search for Abbeville Institute, and of course, you've got it right there. Bang, you get it. You've got the Abbeville Institute on the go. You have access to our podcast, all of our lectures, our website. It's a great way to keep up with us and not have to actually go onto a desktop or something to get our material. So the Abbeville Institute app is a fantastic way to uh, help us explore what's true and valuable in the Southern tradition. And again, free of charge. So you want to get that thing. Also, remember, we exist on your generous contributions alone. So if you like what we do, if you like the podcast, if you like the website, and you're really going to like some stuff we've got coming, I don't know the exact date, but it's going to be great stuff. You're going to want to contribute to the Institute, help us explore its true and valuable in Southern tradition. You can donate monthly, annually, or a one-time gift. Just go to abbevilleinstitute.org, click on that support tab. Under that, you'll see donor options. You've got all the different options to donate. So you can also buy your Abbeville Institute apparel while you're there. Just click on that support tab, click on shop, and it'll take you out to our uh, apparel store where you can get your embroidered materials. Great stuff, high quality materials. So uh, that's a great way to support the Institute. Show that you love us by wearing your Abbeville Institute shirts around town, your hats, your t-shirts, whatever it is. And of course, always share our material on social media. If you like what we do, share it on Facebook, share it on Twitter. Put that material out there. Let people know you like this podcast. Uh, rate it on iTunes, or actually it's now Apple Podcasts. Rate it on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Rate it there because it is a fantastic way to uh, show people that you like the Southern tradition, what's true and valuable in that tradition, and uh, you support what we do. All right. All that said, let's talk about this week. And we had some interesting stuff this week. And I think in some ways this week is centered on Jeffersonianism, though not entirely, but we did have, um, I look, three pieces that certainly focus on this message, um, four pieces, more, more than likely, uh, that focus on this message. The one that's the outlier, of course, is the piece on black Confederates. And I'll get to that one last because I think it, it, it deserves a little bit of attention. Uh, but we, we began the week with a piece by Clyde Wilson entitled, Whatever Happened to Democracy? And of course, this term democracy is thrown around quite a bit now. Uh, and as he says, the phrase democracy or praise for democracy, I'm sorry, was always was always not always sincere. And the term never had a very strict and clear definition. Um, but he says, look, what people believe about democracy is what Lincoln called it in the Gettysburg Address, government of, by, and for the people. So in practical terms, that means majority rule, as he writes. And in, in that case, Lincoln was not sincere because he headed the party of a large minority, that seized control of the federal government and made brutal war against another large major minority of the people. So, as as Clyde asks, you know, this this brings up the celebration of democracy. You see it all the time. You have people saying, "Well, we're going to if we do this, we're going to lose our democracy. We have to preserve our democracy. We have to do this with our democracy." The question is, who's the people? Who who gets to participate? In majority rule. And of course, as he points out, the founding generation were concerned about pure democracy. They didn't like it. Um, and uh, he says they would be, have been astounded by the notion that a few million, million uninvited immigrants could wade ashore and immediately become decided members of the people. So the founding generation called themselves Republicans, not Democrats. These are people that had a stake in society. Um, and he gets into the difference between Hamiltonians and Jeffersonians, which I think is, is important. Um, he says, um, Hamiltonianism now, Hamiltonianism now universally prevails, except that the constitutional gadgets that they relied on have never quite worked out as they are supposed to. The Jeffersonians, he said, had a bit more trust in the people and the ability to, of the majority to decide justly 
After all, most folks were busy making a living and did not bother the government as long as it did not bother them. It was the elitists, he said, who hung around wanting to be in government. But the, the question is not really democracy anymore. It's equality with a capital E. This is something that Mel Bradford pointed out a long time ago when he had uh, when the neoconservatives started attacking him. He said, look, what you've got is equality with a capital E. That's not real equality. It's not what the founding generation was talking about when they talked about equality. And um, when Jefferson said that in the Declaration, it's not what people think. Look, it's, a, it's, a, it's equal under the law. I mean, Jefferson is living in a world of what he considered to be artificial aristocracy. And so some were more equal than others. And this is, this is George Orwell. This is the communists. The progressives think this, right? Some were more equal than others. The point was that even the king was not above the law. The king had to be held accountable. If you go back and you look at the founding generation, what they said about government, this is why they were so suspicious of the presidency. The king could not be above the law. The president couldn't be above the law. The president had to be removable from office if he violated the law, if he abused power. Um, and, of course, nowadays, that's not what that means. That means to enforce some type of egalitarianism where we're all equal of condition. Jefferson never would have supported that. Jefferson was an elitist just like Hamilton. I mean, Jefferson believed in a natural aristocracy. Jefferson certainly didn't think that everyone was equal. Not even citizens were equal in talents and abilities, but certainly they were equal under the law if they had an equal stake in society. Jefferson was a reformer, but he wasn't someone who believed in this social justice warrior view of equality. So as, as Clyde continues, thus Obama can disdain the people for their guns and Bibles, and Hillary Clinton, like Alexander Hamilton, can describe the people as deplorables. In a genuine government of the people, both of these characters will be sent down in shame for insulting the people. Instead, they gather the votes of a majority of the electorate. He asks, how can this happen? His explanation the American educational system has turned out millions of pseudo-intellectuals, people with no particular intelligence or learning, and who have no real power, but who think that because they share the egalitarian scripture, that they are therefore members of the elite and superior to those deplorables. Right? This is true. Um, they look down on the unwashed of America. And Southerners, of course, are the worst of the unwashed of America because they have all the unacceptable views of society. All the unacceptable views. Now, this is not to say there aren't problems in the South. Of course there are. But Southerners are the worst. In present-day America, vast amounts of national wealth are owned by a tiny fraction of the people. Imperial military bases straddle the globe, and five Supreme Court justices can make social rev uh, revolutions in defiance of law, tradition, religion, and common sense. A private banking cartel controls the credit and currency of the country. The flow of information is effectively controlled by a few unknown oligarchs. There is an unpayable government debt that can never be paid. It's partly owned by foreign powers and will economically enslave our descendants. There is no civilized democratic political debate, but only advertising campaigns competing for market share. He says this cannot possibly be a government of the people, a democracy. It is even an enemy of genuine equality of citizenship. We should stop pretending we are a democracy, but that would be an intolerable blow to American self-esteem, which has long been based on denial of reality. So this is a Jeffersonian look at, at America, certainly. Um, and how, I mean, he, the last paragraph, of course, the Bernie bros would stand up and say, yeah, you know, we got, uh, here it is. He's railing Elizabeth Warren people, railing against the banks. Well, this is why Tucker Carlson can get up on Fox News and say, yeah, I agree with Elizabeth Warren. I mean, we've got some issues here, some fundamental structural problems with society. This is, the, it's also a, a, a um, not populist, but an agrarian critique of finance capital, which is what uh, Clyde Wilson is talking about here. It's not socialism. These people are misguided. The, the, um, Occupy Wall Street folks have the right, they know something is fundamentally wrong, but they're blaming it on the wrong things. They're blaming it just on the people and not the disease, which of course is Hamiltonianism and the fusion of government, banking, and finance. The Federal Reserve might be a private cartel, but it's also very much in line with whatever the general government wants it to do. 
So the government is creating the problem, right? Um, and this is Hamilton's government. This is what Jefferson talked about. This is why the Southern tradition is important in critiquing these type of things that are going on in society. Whatever your political leanings are, you could be on the right, you could be on the left. But certainly, uh, these are problems that, fundamental structural problems that people see, and they know something's wrong, they just don't know what to do about it. This is where we come in, the Southern tradition, Jefferson. Um, and so when you look at the piece on Friday, let's bookend these. St. George Tucker, piece by Alan Mendenhall, which is actually originally published at Law and Liberty, which is a great website. Um, we ran it here. Uh, this piece on St. George Tucker. St. George Tucker is one of the most important legal scholars in American history. But yet, nobody knows anything about this guy. Why? We don't know anything about this guy because St. George Tucker's views on the Constitution would not mesh with how the elites in power, the same people that Clyde is talking about, would want the government to be organized. I mean, this is a decentralized, federal, real federalism position. The states have powers. Clearly, the states have powers. The central government has limited authority, except over commerce and defense. That doesn't work well with a society where you have to have constant wars in that last paragraph. You get in imperial military bases. You get national wealth owned by a fraction of the people. You get a Supreme Court that decides everything. I mean, this doesn't work well with that system. St. George Tucker is out, of, is out of touch, not because he's not right, but because people think, well, that's, that's quaint. That just doesn't work with what we have now. It could. It could. I mean, if, if people believed in this stuff, look, the Supreme Court doesn't have to be the final arbiter of everything. We don't have to have an imperial foreign policy. We don't have to have this type of uh, f fusion, this Hamiltonian fusion of finance, capital, and government. We don't have to have that. Banking, we don't have to have any of that. But people think this is the way for This is the way it is. They're taught this, as Clyde says in their educational establishment. You're not going to get St. George Tucker. Unfortunately, you probably won't even get much of Hamilton anymore. I mean, <laughs> uh, Hamilton, for all of his faults, and he has many of them, I, I, I would at least, I would take Alexander Hamilton over most of, most of the jokers in Washington, D.C. today. Um, but um, we don't even have that, right? So St. George Tucker, it, his, his views on the Constitution is essential reading if you're a, if you're a constitutional scholar, uh, because he's pointing out the real Constitution, the original Constitution. He's, he's, he's uh, describing it describing the powers of the general government. And this is something that we have to understand. Look, if we could resurrect anything out of the Southern tradition, it would be the Southern legal tradition of and this constitutional tradition of decentralization. St. George Tucker, John Taylor of Caroline, Abel Upshur, Al uh, Albert Bledsoe. Uh, these are the people that we would, and, and you, could, you, know, you could say, uh, I mean, Calhoun, of course. Uh, Jefferson. I mean, these are the people that we should be looking to, uh, not some, as Clyde says, pseudo-intellectuals who don't really know anything. Let's read St. George Tucker. It's amazing when, when Mendenhall published this piece in Law and Liberty, I mean, he points out not a whole lot of people know about St. George Tucker. And as Mendenhall begins, there are two basic visions for America, the Hamiltonian and Jeffersonian. The former is nationalist, calling for centralized power, an industrialist, mercantilist society characterized by banking, commercialism, and a robust military. Its early leaders had monarchical tendencies. The latter vision involves a slower, more leisurely, and agrarian society, political decentralization, popular sovereignty, and local republicanism. Think farmers over factories. Uh, and he has a link in this, and even the part we show, to uh, Tucker's view on the Constitution of the United States, which Clyde Wilson actually edited. Uh, this is a Liberty Fund book. Uh, they, they changed his introduction. They weakened it quite substantially. But we ran a whole week on the Tuckers uh, a couple of years ago. I want to say it was either 2000, uh, it's 2016. We ran an entire week on the Tuckers. Uh, and not just St. George Tucker, who was there, but also John Randolph Tucker, um, which is an unknown Tucker, um, uh, for example. 
Um, so go back and if you just pull up Tucker on the website, do a little search, pull up Tucker. You got all kinds of great stuff on the Tuckers. So um, the Tuckers are important. Um, and then uh, if you look at the piece on Thursday, Neo Jack Neo Neocon Jacobins. This is a piece by uh, uh, A. C. Gleason or Aaron Gleason. Uh, he was a podcaster. Uh, he was a theologian. Really interesting. He gets into, of course, um, how the neoconservative position is fostered by National Review and by neoconservative. He's getting into the Lincolnites, the Hamiltonians. And he uses the Amistad film as an interesting uh, jumping point for this. Um, and how the neocons are essentially buying in to the radical leftist agenda in America. It was anti-tradition, the same thing that Clyde Wilson was talking about in the piece on, uh, on the Jeffersonians' uh, democracy. Um, it's that position. As Gleason said, neoconservatism places all its hopes and dreams in a nationalized constitution. There's a third way, the way of Burke, Jefferson, and the South, loving the people who we actually know within our little platoons, regardless of skin color or class. It's localism. This is why democracy, when you look at what people are saying, again, it's, it's this faux position. It doesn't really work, does it? It's, it's, it's alien to the American experience. It's alien to what Americans understood as republicanism and democracy back in the founding period. So, I, I, I like this piece because, again, he uses, an, he uses that conversation in Amistad uh, between a couple of characters to highlight this. Um, He says uh, the point that a couple of these characters are making is obvious. It's the same argument made against our contemporary abolitionist movement. The left constantly smears pro-lifers as only caring about babies until they are born. Um, this is exactly what Adams was doing with his bombastic rhetoric about the blood of millions of white men, when he, whether he realized it or not. He was engaging the, in that most common of northern hobbies, the signaling of virtue, which is exactly what 1619 Project and its malcontents is all about. To be sure, he says it's also about bad history, sloppy economics, and why Donald Trump is literally Hitler. But mostly it's about the woke left self-flagellation and the neocon rights unwavering faith and nationalism over federalism. With, when these sides clash, the casualty is always the same, the truth. So, um, this is the problem. Nationalism in a top-down structure, which is the antithesis of the Southern tradition, <clears throat> creates a climate where you have constant antagonisms. I mean, this is Lincoln enforcing the boundaries of the Union. So, Lincoln carries forward the Hamiltonian tradition, not the Jeffersonian tradition. I mean, there, there were those back... Historians who tried to make a case that Lincoln was somehow carrying forward the anti-federalist tradition, <laughs> in no way is that ever the case. But there were those that tried to do it, <clears throat> and I think that uh, Gleason has done a good job pointing these things out. And of course, you have the piece on uh, Tuesday, the book review by Kevin Goodsman, on a very popular book uh, came out. It was uh, David uh, David Donald's Lincoln came out in 1995. Uh, and he takes apart this book. Um, uh, Donald is simply just worshiping Abraham Lincoln. And this is where you have the neoconservative, the Gelzos, the Donalds, uh, you know, the the Susan, whoever it is on the on the neoconservative right. I mean, they love Abraham Lincoln, and they don't see the inconsistency in it. If they're going to promote some type of conservative society, maintaining tradition, Lincoln was not doing any of that. Now, he was a certain type of American. He was a Hamiltonian nationalist. Um, but uh, he was certainly uh, a man who favored a Hamiltonian centralist position over the Jeffersonian decentralist position.
As Gutzman says, the book then is yet another of the books President Jefferson Davis predicted would be the fruit of the War of Northern Aggression, books telling the story from the Union side. What is essentially a, 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 a political, uh, fascistic political tendency, excuse me, one that puts a fallacious history and blind devotion to Union above all else, has the full support of the academic historical profession. Today, failure to call Frederick Douglass great, and is the only great man other than Lincoln in this volume, is simply unthinkable. Disagreement with Lincoln's absurd misappropriations of passages from the Bible never occurs, and lamenting that, the, that he destroyed the government created by the sovereign states never enters the imagination. The victors have indeed written the history. Once Lincoln's men were through with the Confederacy, they turned their tender ministrations on the Indians. The fate of the Indians is a subject of much breast-beating, but the CSA remains the object of scorn among Ivy League historians. Donald offers no explicit judgment on either of these matters, leaving it to his narrative to tell his story. Um, so, again, Goodman's very critical of, of the Lincoln myth, which is important. I mean, the Lincoln myth, if you can get rid of that Lincoln myth, you can, you can change the entire view of American history. Uh, that Lincoln was somehow aligned with the founding generation. That Lincoln, I mean, this is, this is the Straussians, this is the Jaffites, these are people that say, you know, we've got the, deck, the proposition nation. That's Lincoln myth. It is key to understanding where we are in 2019 and why St. George Tucker doesn't get any currency, but Abraham Lincoln certainly does. So again, all of these pieces work together to explain this destruction of Jeffersonianism in America, this destruction of real federalism, the ignorance on people like St. George Tucker and John Taylor of Caroline, but the championing of uh, of Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln, and if you, again, if you don't call if you, if you don't call them great, well then you're just a pariah. I mean, Gutzman is right on with this. If you don't call these people great, if you, if you don't have the same views on Lincoln and Douglass, well, good luck getting a job in a major academic institution. Uh, and I point to Gelzo on this. Gelzo has been hired at Princeton, and I talked about this before. I mean, Pr Gelzo is completely acceptable to Princeton. Why? Because he has all the acceptable views on the right things. Lincoln is great. Uh, he is in favor of Reconstruction and reconstructing the South. The only thing, I mean, it's just, he's just a guy that uh, thinks we just have gone too far in some areas. But um, he doesn't see the inconsistency in Lincoln's revolution, supporting Lincoln's revolution, and then, to, and then criticizing the left, which are simply carrying forward, Lincoln, forward Lincoln's revolution. He doesn't see how this could be problematic, ultimately. Now, the other area that, of course, nowadays, if you mention any of this and you don't come up with the standard position, which is now um, uh, border plate, is that black Confederates are a myth. If you say anything else, that black Confederates are, are, are not, if you say that, well, look, I mean, I think that there's there were some black Confederates. No, no. No, no, because you have this new book out by Kevin Levin. Levin, Levine, I don't know, one of the two. Kevin Levin, Levine. And uh, this particular book is by, I think it's UNC Press. Uh, we're going to review it at some point. But um, it's, it's, taking, it's supposedly taking apart the black Confederate myth. It didn't exist. It didn't start till 1977. It didn't start till you get to the Civil Rights Movement and really roots and other things. And people in the South were saying, well, look, we're not racist. We have black Confederates. And so it was all just a figment of our imagination that these people, it was all created in the 1970s. I mean, this is when it happened. There's no evidence that anybody talked about this beforehand, before this point. All of that was just a bunch of people joking around with black Southerners. They didn't really believe these things. Just a minstrel show, right? This is all it was. And then there's the reality of that. So the thing I like about this piece on Wednesday, Wednesday by Shane Anderson. Now, Shane Anderson treats this with the care that needs it needs to be treated with. Look, you can't say there were hundreds of thousands of black Confederate soldiers. I mean, that is a myth. But th this is what Levin and others have tried to do. They try to put up a straw man, and you take down the straw man. Well, these people are just all crazy that say these things. Uh, you can't say that. But when you, it's all semantics, though, because how you define a soldier, and, and I've, we've talked about this extensively on this particular podcast. How do you define a soldier? 
I mean, today, or how do you find a soldier of free will? Is a drafted man, a conscripted man, is he, is he a soldier of free will? And we know we had a lot of those in the North, conscripted men, who were fighting against their will. If they didn't show up, they would get shot. Or if they tried to desert, they would get shot or arrested. If they didn't show up, they tried to desert. When they were there, they'd get shot. So are, are these people not essentially enslaved by the central government to go fight the war against the South? So, I mean, where do we draw the line? What do we consider a soldier or not? Is a support man, a teamster that uh, today will we'll take today, a person that never is going to fire a weapon at the enemy, and it takes a tremendous number of these individuals behind the scenes just to keep one man in the field. Are they not? Are they soldiers? Well, Levin Levine would say, well, they went through training and they're recognized as soldiers and they're paid. You got to look at the fact that a lot of these men fighting for the South are militia who weren't really being paid that much at all, if anything, to go fight for the South. So, I mean, the the arguments fall apart so quickly. But the thing I like about this piece by Shane Anderson is that he uses newspaper accounts from the 1860s and afterwards to point out that there were, in fact, black Confederates. Uh, he points out, he, I mean, he just cites the entire paragraph from these newspapers. From the 1860s. Um, Lewis Wigfall, published in March 1861, before the war began. He said this, There are some other matters that we understand and possibly do not. Not only are our non-slaveholders loyal, but even our Negroes are. We have no apprehension whatever of insurrection, not the slightest. We can arm our Negroes and leave them at home when we are temporarily absent. That is a fact. We can arm them and leave them at home. That is a fact. This is Wigfall saying this. So this is really interesting when you get into this and you look at the newspaper articles. And then after the war, I mean, you have all these examples he gives you of um, people saying that we had uh, conf uh, black Confederate soldiers. Uh, here's one from the Times-Picayune from August 1889. A Negro soldier, Major Roper of Bartow County, was in Atlanta yesterday taking steps to secure a pension for Eli Pickett, a Negro who was wounded while serving in the Confederate Army. Eli was, however, born free. He volunteered and his services were accepted. After joining an artillery company, he served in the Army of Tennessee. His record shows that he fought bravely and was a true and faithful soldier. After the war, the other Negroes refused to have anything to do with him because they said he had fought to keep them in slavery. So here you have all the dynamics working. Um, you got both sides of this issue. And then John Buckner of Statesburg, Stateburg, the well-known colored man, died on Saturday, August 17th, age 60 years. John Buckner was always a freeman and at the breaking out of the war enlisted as a regular soldier and Captain P.P. Gallier's company. He served subsequently in Captain Boykin's company and later as a scout. He was a faithful soldier, and when the war was over, he remained true to his friends and was a true and tried Democrat. This is from a South Carolina newspaper in 1895. And after we published this, one of his direct descendants emailed us and said, I've got all the information. This is all 100% true. He was half black, half Cherokee, but he was recognized as a soldier. So... If there's one black Confederate, there's one. I mean, they existed, right? So, I mean, this is this is the thing. We know that some existed. Uh, we know that there was support. We know all these things were happening. But, of course, the effort to, to do away with this is politically motivated because, uh, and, and they would say, of course, to say these things is political. I'm not, there's no political motivation here. I'm, this is historian. I'm a historian saying, well, these things were there, so why would you say it doesn't exist? Well, because the political motivation is to say, well, it doesn't exist, so you uh, nasty people in the South can't say that there was some kind of racial egalitarianism. No one's saying that. In fact, the newspaper before that says these, I mean, there are some ex-slaves very upset with this guy for fighting for the Confederacy. Um, I mean, no one's saying these things, but the, the fact that they existed and that sometimes will even be admitted, well, yeah, sometimes they picked up arms, sometimes they did these things. Well, that means that it existed, right? So this is this is the point. 
Uh, from a historian standpoint, these things existed. It's sloppy to say that they don't. There's some myth behind this, or that it's some conspiracy. I mean, it's ridiculous to assert these things. But anyways, I love this piece. I think Mr. Anderson did a nice job with it. I think all the pieces this week were great. Uh, looking at that Jeffersonian tradition, and uh, of course Clyde Wilson railing against the modern academics, which is essentially what the effort is against. Uh, any kind of nuanced understanding of Southern society. It has to be this way, and that's the only way, as uh, Kevin Gutzman points out, too. So this is the real problem with American history and society in general, and it's something that the Abbeville Institute tries to combat on a daily basis. All right, so I hope you enjoyed this week at the Abbeville Institute. Until next time, good day. <laughs>